This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all in one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. You can check out Squarespace through the link in the description below, and I'll tell you more about them in just a bit. Thamesmead, southeast London, bordering the boroughs of Greenwich and Bexley. Film buffs may recognize this area as the location for many scenes of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. The council estate in South Millake had been the backdrop for many of the antics of Alex Delarge and his white-clad juvenile delinquents. But this area is also home to another iconic location where criminals rubbed shoulders with terrorists, serial killers, and rapists, as well as activists, politicians, and Britain's most violent prisoner, Mr. Charles Branson himself. Luckily, they are all behind bars. I'm talking about Britain's highest security prison, possibly the toughest in the country. In today's geographics, we'll peek behind the thick walls of HMP Belmarsh, the infamous institution once known as the UK's Guantanamo Bay. When the construction of HMP Belmarsh was finalized in 1991, it was something of an event. This was the first prison to be built in London for more than a century. The last one had been Wormwood Scrubs back in 1874. This vast facility is surrounded by a rectangular wall, its perimeter 1.6 kilometers in total. It encloses four equally sized housing blocks, each shaped as a cross. But to give you a better idea of how Belmarsh is structured, let's reconstruct the experience of being interned there. I would ask you to ponder the imaginable that yours truly is trialed and sentenced for keeping his writers chained to a typewriter. <laughs> Upon arrival at Thamesmead Prison, I'd be able to contact a family member by phone. Next, I'd meet a member of staff who'd check about my immediate health and well-being needs. This measure is necessary to identify potential suicide risks. Over the following week, I'd go through an induction period in which prison officials would address my mental and sexual health as well as any substance misuse issues. Depending on the sentence I've received, they may even discuss my need or desire for education and training. During induction, I'll also be shown to my room, which could be a single, double, or triple. Belmarsh has struggled with overcrowding in the past, but as of 2021, it has an occupancy of 662 convicts, 84% capacity. Not bad considering that the UK average is 102%. Out of these 662 residents, 204 are considered to be high risk to themselves, to other inmates, but mostly to society. Currently, there are 17 terrorists and 187 murderers. The population is spread over four house blocks, each three stories high. Initially, I'll be assigned to Block 3, dedicated to new arrivals. If the authorities believe that my addiction to caffeine has gotten out of hand, it has, I may be transferred to Block 4, assigned to detoxification programs. There's no coffee in prison? <laughs> Otherwise, due to those kidnapping charges, I may have to relocate to Block 1. This is reserved for prisoners serving long-term sentences. From there, I could direct my envy at the residents of Block 2, who are on a short-term sentence. Block 1 may endure one of the harshest regimes, but it is also home to the London Pathway Progression Unit, or LPPU. This unit is designed for offenders at high risk of self-harm, or may have had complex needs derived from personality disorders or other psychological difficulties. The LPPU is is not intended to treat these convicts, rather to provide an assistance pathway towards reintegration into society. Not all inmates are admitted into the LPPU, but those who are do so within two years of release. Then there also exists the High Security Unit, or HSU, Belmarsh's segregation facility and solitary confinement area. Deep within the HSU, should I be sent there, I might even experience a visit to the box, a prison within the prison guarded by 20-foot concrete walls. The box's main feature is the contingency suite, designed for high-profile prisoners deemed at risk of harming others or themselves. The doors are operated only via remote control via a central control station. The room has sealed windows, no bed, sink, toilet, nor access to water. Upon release from the box, prisoners are returned to their standard cells where they would be subject to a special observation protocol. This includes four roll checks carried out over a period of 24 hours as well as spot checks during the night. After the first few weeks, prisoners might get into a stable routine and take advantage of some of the opportunities offered by Belmarsh staff. For example, they can enroll in education or professional training provided in conjunction with Manchester College, or you could hit one of the gyms. One works in partnership with Charlton Athletic Football Club and delivers accredited courses to coach teams in the sport that Americans call soccer. Belmarsh prisoners all have a phone in their room, but they're inactive after 10 p.m. They can only place calls to a list of contacts pre-vetted by the staff. Now, after a year in prison, you might get a little bit bored. So how hard is it to break out of Belmarsh? 
Apparently very hard, since its foundation, there has only been one attempt at a jailbreak in 2010. This was foiled in time by prison guards who found a rope made from torn bedsheets in one of the cells. The mastermind of the plot was on a two-year sentence for violent assault at a wedding reception. It's not clear whether he had any accomplices or what he was going to use the rope for. In any case, they were sent to the HSU and forced to wear a special uniform to indicate their flight risk blue and yellow. Over time, there have been protests outside the prison. The most notorious demonstrations were those linked to the detention of alleged Islamist terrorists in the early 2000s, when the prison was dubbed the UK's Guantanamo Bay. Following the 9-11 attacks and the increased risk of fundamentalist terrorism, British Parliament approved a new law, the Anti-Terrorism Crime and Security Act. According to this act, the Home Office could detain without trial any foreign national suspected of links with terrorism. These suspects may have opted for deportation unless they were likely to face persecution, torture, or death in their homeland. In December of 2001, nine foreign nationals were detained by police under these laws and taken to Belmarsh. They were kept in custody for three years, unable to see any of the evidence against them waiting for a trial that was not to come. They were effectively stuck in a limbo created by the Anti-Terrorism Act, or as one of their lawyers put it, they had been entombed in concrete. Human rights organizations staged demonstrations outside Belmarsh, branding it a Guantanamo in our own backyard. The reference was, of course, to the prison camp Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. This was, of course, where U.S. security services held more than 600 alleged or confirmed Islamic terrorists and insurgents. Amnesty International and other groups pointed out that the Belmarsh Nine suffered similarly dire conditions. They were being held in cramped cells for 22 hours a day with inadequate health care and restricted access to the outside world. Paradoxically, the UK government had been lobbying the US so that four Britons detained in Guantanamo would be given a fair trial, but as pointed out by activists, they were not eager to give the same treatment to their own prisoners. Some of the Belmarsh detainees took their case to the Special Immigration Appeals Commission. On July the 30th, 2002, it was ruled that the Anti-Terror Act discriminated against foreigners as it did not apply against British nationals. But that ruling was later overturned by the Court of Appeals, who said that there was a state of emergency threatening the life of the nation. In April of 2004, one of the Belmarsh detainees, suspect M, described his experience to BBC Radio 4. M was accused of providing members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group with money and false documents. Documents. However, he and his solicitor were denied access to any evidence. Then, after landing in Belmarsh, he was never questioned. He complained, If I am a suspect of terrorism, if they are thinking maybe I will do something against the government or this country, why didn't they come to me and ask me any questions? The detainee described the impact of incarceration on him and other inmates as dramatic. Physically, most of them had lost weight. Psychologically, the effects were even more profound. Three or four of them had become mad, exactly mad. They are not controlled themselves. They are not thinking in a good way. They are talking like you feel they are crazy. Exactly they are crazy. In fact, some of the Belmarsh foreign detainees had to be transferred to Broadmoor Hospital, the oldest high-security psychiatric hospital in the UK. M said one prisoner had even contemplated suicide, although the Home Office reassured the public that detainees had adequate access to mental health care. The detainees then took their case to the House of Lords, or more precisely, to a council of nine senior judges within the House the Law Lords. The Law Lords ruled that the 2001 laws were incompatible with European human rights law. Lord Bingham argued that the Anti-Terrorism Act allowed detentions in a way that discriminates on the ground of nationality or immigration status. Lord Nichols added that indefinite imprisonment without charge or trial is anathema in any country which observes the rule of law. The final blow was dealt by senior judge Lord Hoffman. He acknowledged that extraordinary measures were necessary to protect the UK, provided that the nation was at an existential threat. He quoted as examples the Spanish Armada in Elizabethan times or the feared German invasion in World War I. He also recognized that Islamist terrorists could be a serious threat to the lives of some, indeed many citizens of the nation, but he disputed that extremists could endanger the very existence of the United Kingdom, which had endured far more dangerous foes and catastrophes. His conclusion was that the real threat to the life of the nation, in the sense of a people living in accordance with its traditional laws and political values, comes not from terrorism, but from laws such as these. That is the true measure of what terrorism may achieve. It is for Parliament to decide whether to give the terrorists such a victory. As a consequence, Home Secretary Charles Clark agreed for the special laws to be reviewed in Parliament. The 2001 Act was replaced by the 2005 Prevention of Terrorism Act, which still allowed the Home Office to restrict suspects' liberties 
under control orders. Eventually, this act was repealed in December 2011. Since then, Belmarsh may not be London's Guantanamo, but the strict security regime has not softened one bit. The prisoners continue to attract headlines thanks to its colorful cast of characters. We'll review them next in our catalog of convicted culprits. All right, we'll get back to today's video in just a moment, but first, quick word from today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're starting that website they thought about, that blog, that online store, whatever. And when they're doing it, they're doing it with Squarespace. Squarespace is the platform to use when you're ready to get started on your next web project. If you're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like, well, just use one of Squarespace's beautiful templates, which you're probably seeing on the screen right now. They look good, you customize them very easily, and then you're done. Easy. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on type of person, you've got opinions about well, what exactly your site should look like down to the finest detail. Don't worry, Squarespace is also extremely customizable, so you can do that as well if you fancy it. And once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, there are many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. Everything you'd ever need is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, do it with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash geographics to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now let's get back to it. Let's start with Hashem Abedi, in for life for the murder of 22 people at the Manchester Arena on May the 22nd, 2017. From his base in Libya, this terrorist plotted with his suicide bomber brother to cause mayhem at an Ariana Grande concert. Abedi is now kept in a regime of isolation for up to 20 hours a day. Other convicted extremists include Michael Adebolajo and Michael Adebowale, who in May 2013 murdered fusilier Lee Rigby. After running him over with a car, they finished the serviceman with a meat cleaver. Apparently, the two were allowed to share a cell, engaging in endless late-night conversations. This nocturnal chatter got on the nerves of John Anslow, the Midlands drug baron who allegedly battered them in retaliation. Another Islamist extremist with a knack for edged weapons is Mohisunath Chowdhury. In August 2017, he wielded a katana to attack police officers outside Buckingham Palace. Chowdhury got away on appeal as his lawyers claimed that his act was an attempted suicide. But in 2020, he was convicted again for planning a series of terrorist attacks and beheadings. After his first stint in Thames sides, the would-be samurai declared that in prison he had met many like-minded individuals, including many fundamentalist prisoners. Reaches. The most notorious is Abu Hamza, the Imam of Finsbury Park Mosque, who incited violence against non Muslims. The cleric served time in the high security unit until his extradition to the US in 2012. Shortly before his transfer, Belmarsh guards intercepted a SIM card smuggled by his daughter in law. In November of 2016, the cell doors slammed shut behind far right terrorist Thomas Mayer. Inspired by Nazi and ultra nationalist literature, Mayer was found guilty of murdering Labour MP Joe Cox in June of the same year. In the killer's perception, the EU supporter and mother of two was guilty of endangering Britain's racial purity. Now, not all Belmarsh residents are so violently inclined. Former MP and Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, Geoffrey Archer, was sent to Belmarsh in July 2001 on charges of perjury and perverting the course of justice. He spent less than a month there, enough for him to label it a hellhole. The Thameside jail has played host to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange since May of 2019. As of June 2021, he was planning to marry his fiancée, Stella Morris, who he met while confined in the Ecuadorian embassy. Ms. Morris declares that they are likely to wed inside the prison, which would be a first for Belmarsh. Then there is the convict formerly known as Charles Bronson, now going by the name Charles Salvador. The legendary robber and brawler dubbed Britain's most violent prisoner, married inside Wakefield Prison in 2017. Twenty years prior, he had delighted Belmarsh his guards with a series of charming antics. From September to October 1996, Bronson took five hostages, including three Iraqi hijackers and a doctor. His demands? A plane to Libya, two submachine guns, 5,000 rounds, an axe, and an ice cream. In January 1999, he held hostage an education worker and trashed the prison in a prolonged fit of rage. Furniture and appliances were tossed around Belmarsh by Bronson's powerful hands until he was frustrated by a washing machine which refused to be wrenched off the wall. The guards seized the occasion and knocked him to the ground. Understandably, he was transferred to Whitemore Prison, so I guess he's their problem now.
You may understand how such a troubled institution may expect frequent, unannounced inspections, just to make sure that things don't go more south than normal. In 2018, 2019, and 2020, the Thameside facility was visited first by the Inspectorate of Prisons and then by the local Independent Monitoring Board, or IMB. The 2018 inspection defined the prison population as an extremely complex mix of men. The inmates presenting the higher degree of complexity are those with mental health issues, personality disorders, and challenging behaviors. The audit recognized that such a complex environment required specialized personnel and adequate funding for training and education. Unfortunately, all these resources were in short supply. Moreover, in 2018, Belmarsh was overcrowded, with most of the two-bedroom cells holding three men. A likely result of these factors was the reported increase in the number of violent incidents, a trend in common with other local prisons. The inspectors also monitored the conduct of the staff. While most were described as decent and diligent, a minority of them were singled out as dismissive and disrespectful in treating prisoners. When interviewed, 60% of convicts felt that they were treated with respect, a lower score than comparable prisons. In 2019 and 2020, HMP Belmarsh was visited again by the IMB. These inspections helped paint a picture of what happened inside Britain's toughest prison during the COVID lockdown. The reports mentioned that the lockdown dominated life at Belmarsh, with the prisoners confined to cells for the majority of the time, typically 23 hours a day. The anti-pandemic measures had negative effects on many areas. For example, it brought a stop to all educational and sports-related activity. Convicts with mental health problems were also denied the opportunity of face-to-face -face psychiatric treatment and counseling. As a result, between April 2019 and March 2020, there were 444 incidents of self-harm and three suicides. Another consequence of the lockdown had been the reduction of visits from friends, family, and lawyers. This, too, had a negative impact on the overall mental health of the prison population. But prison staff have also noted a decrease in drug trafficking within the cell block, so we guess that's something. Nonetheless, some inmates and their lawyers have found a way around this problem. The so-called Rule 39 protects their confidential correspondence. They took advantage by sending letters and pictures doused in recreational drugs such as cannabis or spice, a mix of synthetic drugs and herbs. Consequently, you might expect the prisoners to be more chill, and in fact, the IMB did note a decrease in assaults among convicts and staff. But violence remains a major concern. It appears that about 120 different gangs are represented within the walls of the prison, and therefore gang-related violence is frequent. Belmarsh staff enact a split regime, trying to keep rival factions as separate as possible. The most concerning rivalry is Muslims against non-Muslims, which erupted with a major brawl in March 2020. All in all, however, the IMB praised the efforts of the prison authorities to protect inmates and staff from the pandemic. There were only seven positive cases reported. Unfortunately, one of these cases resulted in the patient dying. During the same period, the prison had to contend with four further deaths, the three suicides, and one murder. The victim was a convicted arsonist, Sundeep Guman. On February the 18th, 2020, at 8 p.m., staff heard reports that an attack was underway. When they found Guman, he had suffered a series of lethal head injuries. He was rushed to hospital, but he died the following evening. Detective Chief Inspector Richard Leonard, in charge of the investigations, arrested two inmates the following March on suspicion of attempted murder. The inmates were awaiting trial for a previous offense, so they managed to be released on bail. DCI Leonard continues his inquiry, which is gone going at the time of writing this episode. HMB Belmarsh has been the backdrop for another unsolved death, which took place on the 2nd of November 2020. In this case, the victim was a Brazilian man, Manuel Santos, who was working on a bail application at the time. Santos was interred in the same block as Julian Assange, and in fact, the two had struck up a friendship. According to the future Mrs. Assange, Stella Morris, Manuel was an excellent tenor. He helped Julian read letters in Portuguese, and he was a friend. According to Bail for Immigration Detainees, an organization organization supporting foreign prisoners, Mr. Santos may have taken his own life, but at the time of writing, the circumstances of his death are still unresolved. So this concludes our visit to what may be London's grimmest landmark, one which we all hope we'll never have to visit. But in the meantime, why not suggest in the comments below which institutions you'd like to see us cover next. And thanks for watching. Now, just before you leave today, maybe you're looking for something else to watch. Why not check out my new channel called War of Graphics? Want to know all of the details about some of history's most famous battles and wars? Come join me on War of Graphics from Sherman's March to the Sea to Operation Barbarossa. If it's got people fighting each other or occasionally animals, we will cover it. There is a link below.